Jonathan Wilde came from a poor family and was the oldest of his five siblings. Although some sources claim other dates and places, it's most likely that he was born in Wolverhampton in 1682. His father worked as a carpenter and his mother sold herbs and fruits in the local market in order to make ends meet. After finishing basic education, Wilde became an apprentice at a local buckle makers. He had little success and moved to London. He started working as a servant but was quickly dismissed by his master and was forced to go back to Wolverhampton. Four years later, again looking for work, he returned to London hoping this time things would be better. Wilde's move to London didn't go as planned. By March 1710, he was sent to Wood Street Counter, a debtor's prison. These prisons were extremely corrupt. Gallowers demanded bribes, so inmates could get anything of minor comfort. However, strangely enough, it was in this environment that Wilde thrived. He became popular among the gallowers, running various errands for them, and ended up making a nice sum of money. With his earnings, he managed to repay his debts and the cost of being imprisoned. While in prison, he met Mary Milliner, a prostitute who showed him the life of London's criminal underclass and then brought him into her gang. With the skills and contacts he had made in prison, he was set up for his new criminal life. In 1712, he was released from prison and began to live with Mary Milliner, acting as if they were husband and wife. After some time, Wilde became fully acquainted with the people of London's underworld, as well as the methods they used to avoid justice. Looking to increase his standing in the criminal world, Wilde began to set up his own network, acting as a pimp to other prostitutes, as well as a fence to thieves. A fence is someone who buys stolen goods and looks after them to later sell them on. Wilde's reputation was on the rise, and soon he grew tired of Mary. Fed up with her attitude and believing she was holding him back, he left her and cut off her ear, marking her as a prostitute. In London by this point, crime was extremely high and dramatically rising. Thousands of people made a living from criminal activities. In 1713, Wilde was approached by Charles Hitchin, London's former undermarshal, basically the city's top policeman. Hitchin was extremely corrupt and asked Wilde to aid him in thief taking. Thief taking, as the name suggests, is when you catch a felon or thief and for doing so, the government paid you a £40 reward, around £6,000 in today's money. This was a good opportunity for Wilde, so he accepted, hoping it would move his career in the right direction. During this period, the public were very worried about crime and the lack of effective policing in the city. The most common offence was thievery, but organised crime was also becoming a major problem. In 1714, Hitchin was again working as London's undermarshal. Despite this being beneficial to Wilde, he decided to go his own way, having devised a scheme to make thousands while staying on the side of the law. To run his gang, he opened an office in the Blue Boar Tavern in the Little Old Bailey. To look credible, he called himself Hitchin's deputy, despite no longer working together, and he carried around a sword to make himself feel like an upper class man. Using his gang of thieves, they stole goods and kept them hidden away. Then, after the crime was made public via newspapers, he would use his thieves to state that they had found the goods and returned them to the rightful owner. Wilde always demanded a payment from the owners as a reward so he could cover the costs of running his group. Despite it being his men taking all the risks, he kept most of the reward, giving his gang members a relatively small cut. He also aided the police in catching thieves who were part of other gangs, or even his own men, if they didn't cooperate with his schemes. From 1700 to 1720, selling stolen goods became more and more dangerous. The crime was heavily punished, and police were always on the lookout to catch thieves. For most thieves, it was very easy to steal, but it was much more difficult to successfully sell the goods. However, 
Wilde didn't face this problem, as once his gang stole something, usually by mugging people at night, he would never sell the goods. The group simply stated that they found the goods, and then returned the items. Wilde had everything planned out. He looked good from the outside, as he publicly made known his hatred of thieves, and had complete control over his gang, threatening that he could turn them into the authorities for thievery at any time if they didn't do as he said. With Wilde becoming a key player in thief-taking around London, Hitchin was now his biggest threat. His aim was to incarcerate as many of Hitchin's thieves as possible and eliminate his gang. Hitchin retaliated and published articles which aimed to expose Wilde as the source behind all of the robberies in London. However, it wasn't successful, with few believing the details. Wilde responded and revealed that Hitchin was a frequent client of Molly House's homosexual brothels. His non-corruption, as well as the charge he now faced for being homosexual, destroyed his reputation. With Hitchin gone, Wilde now dominated the criminal activities in London. He had built an empire, and various rumours began to spread. For example, it was supposed that he had a list of every thief in his service, and once they were no longer useful, he cold-heartedly disposed of them, sending them to the gallows. Wilde acted as a hero in public, calling himself Thief Taker General of Great Britain and Ireland. He was proud that he found thieves, and made them face justice. By 1718, he had already caught over 60 thieves. This skill made him very well known around London. By 1720, Wilde had become so known that the Privy Council, a group of advisors to King George I, asked Wilde for potential methods to help control crime. Wilde, knowing this could result in a huge personal gain, recommended that the rewards for catching a thief should be raised. Within the year, he had gone up from £40 to £140. This led to a huge pay increase for Wilde. To make him popular with the people, Wilde always made sure that the public knew about his work and would frequently report to the newspapers about what he was doing. One of his biggest successes was finding evidence against 20 members of the Carrick gang. For this, he was rewarded with £800 around £123,000 in 2019. Although in reality, he was catching these criminals to destroy an opposing gang, he made it seem as if he was doing the country a service. In 1724, one of the most famous thieves of the century was caught by one of Wilde's men. Shepard had previously worked with Wilde, but his lack of cooperation made him too much for Wilde to handle. Shepard was imprisoned on three separate occasions, and each time he had managed to escape. Wilde saw Shepard as a threat, believing he could cause his eventual downfall. He tried to ruin Shepard's reputation, denouncing him in public and trying to get him imprisoned using whatever means necessary. His relentlessness made him disliked among the working classes. Many believed he was extremely corrupt. Eventually, Wilde was successful in getting Shepard locked away. He presented vital information regarding a robbery that Shepard and an accomplice committed against William Niebaum, Shepard's former master. Wilde believed the threat was now resolved, as soon Shepard would be hung. However, on the 31st of August, on the night that Shepard's death warrant arrived, he escaped prison yet again. Shepard's amazing stunts of escaping prison had turned him into a working class hero. His good looks and charming nature made him loved by all. He was now free and had managed to stay clear of Wilde's gang. Shepard's partner, Joseph Blake, who was known as Blueskin, was also caught by Wilde's men. On the 15th of October, Blueskin was tried for the burglary of William Kneebone, the same case that got Shepard a death sentence. Wilde and his men all gave evidence against Blueskin, just as they had done to Shepard. He was convicted and sentenced to death by hanging. Following the trial, Blueskin was devastated and begged Wilde to have his sentence reduced from hanging to transportation. Wilde, maintaining his public hatred to thieves, refused. Blueskin was furious and decided to seek vengeance. He grabbed a knife he had in his pocket 
and attempted to murder Wilde. He got close enough and successfully slashed open his throat. This caused an outroar in the courtroom. Wilde immediately collapsed and was quickly taken to hospital. Despite this gaining Wilde some public sympathy, the people still despised him for the way in which he was pursuing Shepard. The papers reflected this and rumours about his corrupt nature began to spread. A few days after Bluskin's trial, Shepard was caught by police officers after being found drunk outside a tavern. This time Shepard was watched at all times and had no chance of escape. On the 11th of November, much to the delight of Wilde, Bluskin was hanged. Only five days later, his partner Shepard was also hanged. Wilde had been bedbound for weeks, recovering from his injury. He managed to make it back to full strength, but more problems arose when he learned that one of his best men was in prison. He didn't hesitate to act and attempted a violent jailbreak, which was a huge failure. The authorities began searching for him and he had to go into hiding. However, much to his surprise, on the 15th of February, Wilde and one of his men, Quint Arnold, were arrested for the attempt of helping in a jailbreak. Wilde was furious, but stayed calm, hoping it wouldn't completely destroy his reputation. His business was on the decline, and he couldn't effectively run it from his cell in Newgate Prison. He was put on trial, and strong evidence was presented against Wilde, proving that he participated in a violent jailbreak, and also that he possessed stolen jewels. The evidence was too great for Wilde to deny. It was clear that Wilde was going to be found guilty. His gang members saw this, and one by one, they turned on him, giving evidence of his elaborate scheme, which took advantage of the law and how he bribed public officers. The day of Wilde's final trial was set for the 1st of May at the Old Bailey. He was tried on two separate charges of robbery. He was acquitted of the first due to a lack of evidence, but on the second charge, he was found guilty and sentenced to death. Wilde was in shock. He wasn't ready to face the consequences of his actions. Terrified, he asked the judge if his sentence could be delayed or changed, but this was refused. The weeks leading up to his execution date, his health began to dramatically deteriorate. He suffered from gap disease and was beginning to turn insane. He found it difficult to eat or sleep and he even couldn't find peace at church. On the day of his execution, in the early hours of the morning, he tried to take his own life by drinking a bottle of laudanum. His attempt was unsuccessful, and he immediately began to vomit. Not long after, he fainted and fell into a deep coma. Wilde was still in a coma when he was moved to the gallows at Tyburn. His hanging was a great event. Tickets of the best viewpoints were sold, and thousands of people came to watch. The people of London were cheering, seeing Wilde's execution as a triumph against their corrupt oppressors. Wilde was accompanied at Tyburn by William Sperry, Robert Sanford and Robert Harbum. All of them were condemned to die. Wilde was still in his coma, so they saved his execution till last. The hangman, Richard Arnett, actually knew Wilde as he had been a guest at his wedding. However, he didn't let that affect his job. He wrapped the rope around Wilde's neck and pulled the lever, ending his life. In the middle of the night, Wilde's body was secretly moved and buried in the churchyard of St Pancras Old Church. It was a wish of Wilde's to be buried there, alongside Elizabeth Mann, his third wife. However, this burial only lasted a few decades, as in the late 18th century, autopsies were beginning to be performed on the most notorious criminals. His body was dug up, and went on to be sold to the Royal College of Surgeons for dissection. Nowadays, in the Royal College of Surgeons Hunterian Museum in London, Wilde's remains are on display. Thank you everyone for watching this episode of Forgotten Lives on Jonathan Wilde. If you haven't seen the episode on Jack Shepard, I highly recommend it, as the two stories are linked in a certain way. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please like and subscribe. And I will see you in the next Forgotten Life. Thank you.